Hi everyone, hope you all are doing well. My name is Sehiz Deep Kaur and I'm working as a project associate with UNDP. Uh, today I'll be presenting my lecture on integrating gender aspects in natural resource management. So I basically will be focusing on how women play a key role in NRM. Plus the entire lecture would be revolving around SDG 5, Sustainable Development Goal 5, which is gender equality. So let's start by understanding what natural resource management is. NRM is the management of natural resources such as land, water, soil, animals, plants with a particular focus on how management affects the lifestyle, the quality of life for both present as well as the future generation. So basically in this approach, we aim to work together with the communities to manage the environment in a way that achieves balance between our collective needs for resources and the needs of the environment. All right, now let's study the importance of gender in NRM. At first glance, the relationship between society and the environment seems to affect both men and women in a very similar way. For example, let's take COVID. On the surface, it looks like that everyone is being affected in a similar manner. However, the reality is different. The distinct rules and interactions men and women have with the environment mean that any impact on them is also different. Gender ratios are cut across NRM activities in several ways. I'll just name a few. First being men and women, do not have equal rights over natural resources. Second, due to the different rules based on gender division of labor, they have different priorities and benefit differently from resource, natural resource use. Third, men and women have different realities and therefore use natural resource in different ways and different rates as well. Women usually have different roles in the environment, in our environment, the families, in our community. For example, Men are basically shown as responsible for income generations or uh, are decision makers of the house, while women take on substantial activities and look after the family. When it comes to environment protection and management, they're also likely to have different opinions, attitudes, priorities, and power over sources. They also interact differently with the environment, which provides them different opportunities to protect and manage it in a more sustainable manner. Now let's try and understand why is it important for women to be considered in NRM. Women have the potential to play a critical role in this process as they use and manage land and other natural resources while meeting water, food and energy needs in households as well as communities. However, this use rarely translates into women being allowed to influence the distribution of natural resources or even being given a decision-making role when the management of resources is discussed. I'm highlighting few points now, which will show you how men and women contribute to environment differently. First being their roles. Men and women have different roles and responsibilities within their communities that are influenced by culture and social factors. However, women's roles are often less visible than men's and aren't even formally recognized, I'm so sorry. For example, women frequently carry out labor on land. However, they don't even hold formal tenure right to that land. Women spend a great deal of time collecting water, fuel, food and fodder for family subsistence. And this is not even considered as work. Second, I'll be highlighting their rights. Rights and access to land and control over it are often different for both men and women. For instance, like I told you before, women do not hold the lack, women have the lack of tenure rights on land. And this is the same case with the resources as well, such as trees and forests. So, for example, there's a little benefit of women being involved in environment conservation and tree planning schemes. But how are these women supposed to get this, uh, this little bit of benefit which, which the policies are giving them when only a little percentage of women have control over these lands? Now, third, I'll talk about decision making. In many parts of the world, men are considered the official decision makers within the community and have a larger control and power over the natural resources and how they are managed. Social and cultural barriers may prevent women from decision making as well, and they often lack the confidence to voice their opinions. So they are largely absent from the decision making in the environment management, despite being the crucial or the critical actors in the scene. Then the social and cultural barriers. It's important to be aware that cultural and social barriers do exist and to create an environment where women can participate is not easy. We need to recognize that such barriers increase the vulnerability of a woman. If they do not participate, then decision made may be unfavorable to them. 
the cultural limitations on women can leave them more vulnerable to natural disasters than men. Then the technology. It's often assumed that innovations such as introduction, introducing new seeds and new technology or new forestry equipments may benefit everyone equally. The belief is often that by targeting technology for men, by targeting technology for men, it would be tickling down, it will tickle down to women. However, research shows that the technological innovations are far from benefiting all members of the community. Men may often favor cash crops such as tobacco for greater money, for greater income. Whereas women prefer crops such as staple that assist them in their daily needs. Te technology is designed in a way, is basically designed for us to improve the uh, productivity. But if it is failing, if it fails to do so for women, why are they going to use it? For example, if the technology or the machinery is way too heavy or way too time consuming for them, women are going to be very reluctant to use them. So to effectively conserve and sustainably use biodiversity, it is important to recognize the different roles, knowledge and responsibilities for both men and women in NRM. Do you guys know women in a household generate four times more income from forest products than men? They participate, however, far less in formal forest gatherings, such as forest user groups. Men and women have different and complementary knowledge of their environment, as we all know by now, compared to men Women, however, are often able to identify a broader range of plant species. A study revealed that in a same environment, women could list 31 uses of a tree, while men could only list 8. And then in 135 different societies, women collect about 80% of the total wild vegetables used for food. Such a huge work which is being done by women, but still is being unrecognized. So till now we have studied what is NRM, one. Second, how the gender affects NRM. Now we'll be studying what is gender mainstreaming and how gender mainstreaming will help us achieve SDG 5, that is gender equality. What is gender mainstreaming? Gender mainstreaming is basically an approach to policy making that takes into account both men and women, their interests and their concerns. It means integrating a gender equality perspective at all stages and level of policies, programs and projects. Men and women have different needs and living conditions and circumstances including unequal access and control over power, resources, human rights and institutions including justice system. The situation of women and men also differs according to what country they are from, what age they, they have, what's their age, their ethnicity, their social culture, their social background and so many other factors. The aim of gender mainstreaming is to take into account these differences when designing, implementing and evaluating policy so that they can benefit both men and women equally. Now, why do you think gender mainstreaming is important? Several studies till now have shown that gender inequalities have direct costs on the environment. In many cases, public policies have been based on the needs of dominant group of the society or on the needs of those who are traditionally been their decision makers, that is men. Evidently, decisions regarding public policies and services which do not fully take into account the needs and situations of all final users may lead to inappropriate solutions and inadequate allocations of public funds. Gender mainstreaming is an inclusive strategy aimed to integrate the need of all people. It is also based on the fact that women are not vulnerable groups as they represent more than half of the population in most of the societies. Gender mainstreaming is a strategy to improve the quality of natural resources and ensuring a more efficient allocation of funds which will lead to better results. Better results mean increased well-being for both men and women and the creation of more specific, just and sustainable society. Now, in the end, we need to realize that understanding the relationship between gender and natural resource management is key in addressing environmental challenges in an equitable and sustainable way. Now, in my view, there are few steps which can help in integrating gender in NRM. First, by recognizing that there are gender-based differences in the roles, responsibilities and contribution of both men and women and take these into consideration. 
Second, by recognizing the value of women's knowledge, skills and practices and their rights to benefit from the fruit of their own labor. Third, we need to ensure sound and equitable policy to provide incentives for women for sustainable use of natural resources. Fourth, we have to ensure fair and equitable sharing of benefits for both men and women. And last, ensuring active participation of women in planning and decision making, not just at ground level, but in all levels of the society. Now, I would like to end my lecture with a small video. This video will make you understand why women and NRM need to go hand in hand, why integrating gender in NRM is a very important thing to be done. I really hope that by the end of this video and by the end of my lecture, there's one question in your mind, that why women being such an important part of the society are still being neglected. I would like to leave you on that note. Thank you so much. Hope you enjoy the video. Gender inequality doesn't make sense on any level. By marginalizing the rights of women, we deny ourselves the opportunity to lift millions of men, women and children out of poverty, not to mention the chance of a just and fair world. From birth, girls and boys, women and men are expected by society to play certain roles and behave in certain ways based on traditions, religion and other beliefs. These behaviors are learned and shape the gender norms in a society. Unfortunately, in many countries, gender norms create disadvantages for women. Often, girls are not sent to school. When they become women, they then have limited ability to earn money or realize their potential. Rural women play a major role in agricultural development. However, in many developing countries, women cannot formally own land. Without land, they cannot get loans to invest in their farms or businesses. This also means they have no control over the use of land or the benefits that come from it. Men generally control the household decisions, like how to use the family's assets. These disadvantages are often reinforced by practices that limit women's access to services, like training. Cultural beliefs can also restrict women's opportunities such as in parts of Zambia where women cannot paddle their boats as it is considered bad omen. The result of these issues? Women remain poor and agricultural production cannot reach its potential, perpetuating poverty and hunger in the developing world. The social norms that limit women's opportunities need to be understood and then changed. By taking a gender transformative approach, we can influence social norms and bridge the gaps in access to resources and services between men and women in a lasting manner. Change is needed on many levels and both men and women must be involved for it to happen. Research and development organizations need to invest in programs that promote gender equality alongside improving productivity and incomes. Policies need to be implemented that increase women's access to services and resources. Communities need to support women as farmers and as leaders. Increasing women's voice and agency is a valuable end in its own right. When development organizations, policies and communities support the success of women, we have a chance to reduce extreme poverty and boost shared prosperity for girls and boys, women and men, around the world.